Speculation abounds on the origins of The Real Sopranos, the groundbreaking HBO show created by David Chase, starring James Gandolfini as the show's namesake, Tony Soprano. It's widely thought that Tony is based on a few different members of the Mafia, specifically those who operated out of New Jersey, but that video in itself will be released at a future date. Meanwhile, the family as a whole is also largely influenced by an actual New Jersey outfit. David Chase was free to pick and choose various storylines and compelling occurrences from across the entire history of the American Mafia, of course, and more specifically from the Boyardo faction of the New Jersey mobsters who are aligned with the Genovese family. But when push comes to shove, it's largely the DeCavalcante family, also known as the North Jersey Mafia, that serves as the real-life basis for the Sopranos. And according to FBI recordings made in the 60s, a time that David Chase reveres, we get intimate insight into the life and times of Sam DeCavalcante, the boss of the crime family that bore its name. An FBI bug recorded his every word to his secretary when he arrived at his office one morning in 1964. I had a terrible dream about a bunch of cops, he said, adding that the secretary had featured in it. You were screaming. You had pearls on. Everything was so screwed up. Mary, his wife, woke me up. Something about pearls. I don't remember. The bug also recorded the then 52-year-old being robustly intimate with the secretary. Her husband called the office and DeCavalcante chatted with him while periodically muffling the phone and muttering encouraging endearments to her. When the transcripts were unsealed in court, it became apparent that the affair with the secretary was just one of many liaisons. The wife, Mary, remained remarkably restrained when it came to a reporter showing up at her home in Princeton Township. She opened the front door and spoke over the barking of her schnauzer. If you don't mind, I'd rather not talk about it, she said. I don't mind your asking, but I hope you appreciate my feelings. Underboss Frank Majuri was reported telling Sam DeCavalcante that he shouldn't run around because Katina and Gambino don't. Majuri meant Gerardo Katina of the Genovese crime family and Carlo Gambino of the family of that name. The Genovese and the Gambino families were in among the five families of New York, the Ivy League of the Mafia. The operate in the realm made mythic by the Godfather and their bosses are figures of legend. DeCavalcante would have loved to have been considered their equal. Never mind that DeCavalcante had transferred a bunch of ever-warring factions into an immensely profitable operation. He had recently doubled the number of main members and he was taking full advantage of his native state's remarkable propensity for corruption at all levels of government. DeCavalcante can be heard on recordings expressing some bitterness when Joe Colombo of the Colombo crime family was appointed to the ruling commission at Carlo Gambino's urging. DeCavalcante had hoped that he himself might get the honor and make his family the sixth on the commission. Colombo sits like a baby next to Carl all the time, DeCavalcante said. He'll do anything Carl wants him to do. DeCavalcante went on to say, Sometimes, Frank, the more things you see, the more dissolution you become. You know, honesty and honorability, those things. Majuri replied, Yeah, if you're a real honest guy, you wind up a hunchback with headaches. A feeling that he had not received his due respect may have added to DeCavalcante's dislike for the nicknames Sam the Plumber, he owned a heating and plumbing company, and The Claw. He made sure to collect every penny in loan sharking. He preferred The Count. He told people his father had been an Italian marquis. Whatever the truth of his lineage, Di Cavalcante did have a certain courtly touch when he settled disputes or helped a younger mafioso through a rough patch in their marriage. Di Cavalcante always paid a good price when persuading judges and politicians and cops to sell their souls. He sounded like any worried father when he fretted aloud about his three sons but he could turn instantly savage when his authority was challenged. He was recording telling Majuri of going with the fellow mobster Gaetano Vastola to visit someone who had failed to come in for a chat when summoned. Ba-boom, he hit him, De Cavalcante said. I thought he was going to fly through the wall. Then he hit him another one. He started hollering, help, help. I told him, now do you understand what I mean when I say I want to see you? He replied, yes, I'll do anything you say. De Cavalcante added to Majuri, you know, I work one way, and that's the right way. Saying a thing and doing it are two different things. He declared that this thing of ours and our friends were the same, whether it be among the five families of New York or his family in New Jersey. Cosa Nostra is Cosa Nostra, he declared. Being that he was recorded saying this, it did little to improve his stature on the other side of the Hudson. It also helped send him to prison. He retired to Florida upon his release. The new boss was Giovanni John the Eagle Rigi. He landed in prison after seeking to curry favor with John Gotti by arranging the murder of a former newspaper editor turned toxic waste dumper and potential informant. 
Regis' hope to put the Di Cavalcante family back on the map with the killing was dashed when it became known that when stealing license plate to put on a getaway car, one of the hit squad had inadvertently chosen the plates of a vehicle belonging to the wife of a well-known mobster. The plate number was written down by a witness who saw the hitman tossing the guns in the stream. I'm sorry, I hope everybody doesn't blame me, an informant would quote the hapless hitman saying before he himself was hit. Giacomo Jake Amari became the acting boss and thumbed his nose at the five families by recruiting new members in New York and operating a social club in Little Italy. He was then summoned to a sit-down where he agreed to withdraw. He soon died of stomach cancer. Rigi placed the family under day-to-day direction of a ruling panel headed by Vastola, whose various activities ranged from shaking down dice games to promoting concerts by Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin. He also ran roulette records and golfed on occasion with Sammy Davis Jr. Vastola then landed in prison and John D'Amato became acting boss until the girlfriend he shared with another mobster revealed that he was bisexual. Rigi is said to have been given the go-ahead from prison for a killer named Anthony Capo to dispatch D'Amato. Nobody's going to respect us if we have a gay homosexual boss sitting down discussing La Cosa Nostra business, Capo later testified. The killing was one of a litany of murders and other crimes listed in a racketeering indictment made possible by an informant who had been assisting the FBI for a decade. More than 30 members and associates of the family were arrested. One of them decided to cooperate and a dozen more were grabbed. Rigi was hit with another 10 years just as he was about to be freed. By 2005, nearly 50 people connected with the Di Cavalcante family were behind bars. The vaunted five families were faring even worse, to the point of virtual extinction. And they were now finding themselves overshadowed by a TV show about a New Jersey crime family modeled after the Di Cavalcante family. In fact, the show's remarkable success could be attributed in part to it not being in the realm of the Godfather and the five families. The opening sequence of the first episode in 1999 made clear that this was New Jersey, and Tony Soprano was not Michael Corleone. He was a knock-around Jersey guy rising to power in the fictional DeMeo family, founded by Erkley DeMeo, who had been sent to prison just like Sam de Cavalcante. The DeMeo family had then been taken over by Jackie Aprile, who dies of stomach cancer just like Jake Amari. The members include Vito Spadafore, who is killed after it becomes known he is gay, just as John D'Amato was killed. By stepping outside myth, the show brought the expectation that it would be something new and authentic. And authentic it was, almost as if the FBI had just kept recording after Di Cavalcante's death in 1997 and on through Amari's death and into the present day. The scene where the FBI breaks into Tony's basement to plan a bug was so realistic that an agent who happened to encounter two of the show's head writers at the Buffalo Cub in Santa Monica asked where they got their information. The writers just looked at each other and said nothing. Around the end of the first season, an actual FBI electronic device carried by an informant recorded members of the Di Cavalcante family chatting about the show as they drove to a sit-down. Hey, what's this effing thing, Sopranos? Joseph Tenier Sclafani asked. Is this supposed to be us? The thugs have just been bemoaning the continued lack of respect they received from the five families. But that was forgotten as Anthony Rotondo rhapsodized about the Sopranos. What characters, Rotondo said. Great acting. As in The Sopranos, the Di Cavalcante family recruited new arrival from Sicily. Francisco Frank Garacci, hailed from Sam Di Cavalcante's ancestral hometown of Ribera. Garacci is said by the FBI to have been inducted by Rigi in place of the hitman who screwed up with the license plates and otherwise would have been the next to be made. Garacci allegedly rose to acting boss as he continued to work as a foreman with the laborers' union. He hung out at the Ribera Social Club in Elizabeth, remained so low-key that even some members of the family were unaware of his alleged position. His other advantage over the more high-profile families in New York was that law enforcement in New Jersey is more fragmented and less zealous. If Garacci was indeed an acting boss at the time, it seems he's the only one still out there being a gangster similar to fictional Tony Soprano, at however small a scale. The bosses of the five family on the other side of the Hudson River were busy hiding and pretending that they were not in charge of anything when Garachi strode right into Lenny's Brick Oven Pizza in Washington Township, New Jersey, in August 2010 and announced that he was taking over the business. I run the show, the ensuing indictment quotes Garachi, screaming when general manager balked at turning over the receipts. The indictment reports that Garachi then fired the general manager. Which directive GM ignored and continued working, the indictment notes. Garachi and a man who would be arrested with him became more insistent and threatening. 
Two of the restaurant's waitresses, young women in their late teens, began to cry, the indictment says. Several customers became alarmed and exited the restaurant without paying their bills. At least one customer called 911 seeking police assistance. Garachi pleaded guilty and in January 2012, he got off with six months of home confinement, followed by five years probation. He's believed by law enforcement at the time to remain the boss, even though Rigi was released in November 2012 after 22 years in prison. However, Rigi died in 2015, with Garachi dying not long after in 2016 of cancer. In March 2015, the FBI arrested 10 members and associates of the crime family on charges of conspiracy to commit murder and distribution of drugs, including 71-year-old Captain Charles Beeps Stango. In March 2017, Stango was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for conspiracy to commit murder. In July 2022, Capo Charlie Stango was released from federal prison and went into a New York halfway house. At present, Longtime member Charles Big Ears Majuri is sought to be the current boss of the New Jersey crime family. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more of our Mafia TV series, please like and subscribe. Until next time, forget about it.